What makes people create? This is the first question I ask my students in our first painting class. It seems to me that the answer is that people are able to create when they choose to believe that the feelings are important, that the feelings matter. In the year 2014, I've learned that my own body is not truly mine. I would diagnose this Parkinson. Had my body been truly mine, I would refuse to accept it. I even offered my physician to double his fee if he changes his diagnosis. Still, he refused. So, now I have to learn to live with Parkinson. I admit that at times it challenges my joy of living, but even then, I'm grateful that it didn't affect my ability to create, to teach, and to share my feelings, my ideas, my values. This is a sculpture I'm working on now. It's a work in progress. It's in clay, supposed to be finished soon, and then to be casted in bronze. In this sculpture, among other things, I'm trying to contain the effect of aging and Parkinson on my body. Even if you are physically handicapped, feel weak and alone, but you still believe that your feelings, even feelings of frustration and pain, are important, it enables you to soar to higher destinations. The focus on expressing our feelings as something important, worth observing, is a fundamentally empowering idea. Van Gogh is a great example. A poor, lonely, rejected artist whose letters and paintings demonstrate that his creativity came from the belief that for him, maybe even just for him, his feelings were important. This takes courage, especially if you are a woman like many of my students with limited options due to political, social, or financial circumstances. If you agree that your feelings are important, that your feelings matter, worth observing, and your life experience is unique, like anybody's life, you have everything it takes, everything it needs to be an artist. The hand-eye coordination that is needed to paint is no different from the coordination that is needed to eat with knife and fork. Talent is helpful, but it is less important. Actually, talent is irrelevant, because the most, important, the most talented artist in the world is not able to paint your painting. Your painting is just painting waiting just for you. Some artists, when they paint a model, they look at the person in front of them, and they try to transform the model into an interesting painting. They use the model in order to make a painting. I suggest my students a different approach, to use the painting in order to reach the model. The subject matter will be always the human being in front of you. Look at him or at her with compassion, try to understand his or her own feelings and life experience. By attentively looking at the model, the artist is not just giving, not just taking, but also giving. And this mutual experience is empowering for both the artist and the, and, and, the, and the model. In a gallery talk that I had in Tel Aviv Museum, when I had an exhibition there in 2009, I was asked how I choose my models. My answer was, I paint only those who need to be painted. The next question was, who are the people who need to be painted? My answer was simple, everyone. Everybody needs to be painted. Everybody deserves to be looked at, to be recognized. We all deserve to be looked at. Right now, I'm using words in order to share my ideas with you. But in order for my words to reach you, my words, my text, needs my voice. While my words, figuratively, goes down, go down from my brain to my mouth, my voice literally goes up from my lungs, from my vocal cords, to my mouth, and then my voice carries my text to your waiting ears, to be processed in your mind. All this is very exciting. It is happening here and now. Now let me show you an example how it works in painting. The text of this painting, its Shabdak matter, is Rabbi Shai Zahi. Rabbi Shai Zahi was the rabbi that performed my wedding to Rina. The voice of the painting is this flat form that you can see, abstract, flat, simple form that finally, hopefully, will create the, the model. I did this painting, um, it took me like three hours, with, there's no drawing, directly these forms on the canvas, and let's see how it works.
You can see how it is built, step by step. And this is the finished work. Thank you very much. You can see that the text of this painting, it's this rabbi, Shai Zarchi. But the voice is built from these flat forms, and these flat forms between them, there is some kind of movement, rhythm. This rhythm is my voice, like any artist has. I'll show you one more example. This is my father's last sport that I did. You can see that the same flat forms may create all kinds of figures, all kinds of figuration. Now I'll show you a few paintings, large paintings, that have done exactly the same way. This one is called Burial in Kfar Yoshua. Here you can see the funeral of my father's cousin. Of course, it's not just the funeral of this person, but it's a funeral of maybe of this generation, somehow, and some of his, its idea, his ideas and values. Here you can see a detail of that will show you, that shows you the voice of this painting, which is these flat forms that create this music. But the text of this painting, the subject matter, is somebody from my father's generation. You can see it's styling, the way he's dressed. So, um, yeah, very, very uncommon now. This painting is called, uh, as you can see, a Vegetable Garden. At the left side, you can see my mother. And then this is my brother's family, and they plant in this painting a small vegetable garden. This painting is a very large painting, 180 to 270 centimeters. It is called Jezreel Valley with a snake. Can you see the snake? It is hiding, actually it's not hiding, but its colors hides him. He, he is, uh, uh, the snake is in the center of the painting at the very bottom. Okay? So this is the subject matter, this is the text of the painting. I have to tell you that in this painting I didn't paint the right colors, because the colors of the sky were different. They had much more blue in the, in the sky. But sometimes I paint not the colors I see, the colors I feel. And the heat make me, make, made me feel that the sky is yellow. This is the Abel Mountain, the Kinneret. Here you can see a detail of this painting, again the same forms. This painting is called Good Morning, Mr. Shmueli. It is related to a painting by Courbet, never mind. And in this painting, I am a, I am, it's myself, give respect to the peasant, to the farmer. Okay, the artist gives respect to the people that walk the soil. So voice and text are separated in my art and in my teaching and uh, this is very essential to me. So, what might be the relevance of figurative painting today while there are so many technological ways to copy reality? Let's start with the relevance of the text of the painting, of what we paint. When you look at something, nobody knows what you actually see. The image you see is in your mind, alone. You don't know what other people may have seen. The image they see is in their mind. You don't know, for, for example, now here in the auditorium, you can't be sure that other people next to you see exactly the same picture you see. In my class, while I, my students are drawing, for instance, still life, for example, when I check the proportions in student sketch, while we are both looking to the same direction, we are actually comparing the image we see together on, on the paper, okay? Each of us sees his own or her own image, but we can compare this image on the paper. Usually we may agree that we see exactly the same thing. So it might say to us, it may say to us, that we share the same physical world. Now let's see what is the relevance of the voice of the painting. This is a painting by Rembrandt. It is a self-portrait of a young Rembrandt. And this painting is perfect, like, can't be better. Had young, Rembrandt come, had young Rembrandt come to my class, I would have been forced to tell him that I have nothing to teach him. 
So Rembrandt had to return to his studio, and during his lifetime, he created about 80 self-portraits, just for his own eyes, just for his own self-expression. As he grew older, he got better. Unbelievable. He got better by deepening his voice, deepening his unique style. And we are being more touched more by his art. By his art is more, is more moving to us. This raises the question of why. Why is it that when an artist gets deeper to his own soul, to his own style, to his own unique style, to his own unique way of expression, we are being moved and touched by his art? Could have been the opposite. For me, it has to say that when you go deep, deep to your own soul, right there you meet a universal soul we all share. So through painting, we may claim that we share the same physical world, which actually has moral meanings and, and ecological meanings, and therefore even political meanings. Okay? And we may claim that we share the same universal soul. Many of my students are young Arab women. I'm happy to tell you now, as an artist, as artist they achieved an impressive success in the art world. It's especially impressive when you consider they've started their artistic journey with no status, no connection, no encouragement. In fact, for some, it was in direct defiance of the path set for them by their families and culture. They faced all these challenges believing that the feelings are met, important, the feelings matter. They create high-quality painting, high-quality art. And, uh, focusing, looking, and expressing their feelings has given them the emotional courage and the financial power to determine their own destinies. Now, let's see, there are many, many stories. Ah, I want to tell you that the, many, many times they criticize their own community, their own society and their art, but even when they com criticize the communities, they represent the communities as well. There are many stories of how art enabled personal change, sometimes even social change. I will share with you just one story. When I had a studio visit, in one of my Arab students' home, I noticed a new painting of a stone. I say to her, nice, I say to my student. And she told me that this is her mother's first painting. Wow, it was good. A few months later, the same student came to one of my openings in Tel Aviv Museum. In, in Tel Aviv, in the, it was a gallery, it was not a museum, but an exhibition, a group exhibition. I say to the mother, you did a wonderful job. You did a beautiful painting. You are extremely talented. And then she asked me, so have I wasted my life? I said to her, not at all. It is never too late to choose the right path for yourself. It's never too late to make the right choice for yourself. Now at the age of 60, she's a student in my class. I sat with her, like I do with all of my students, to help her look at her life story the life experience. He shared with me a life story, a very complex life story, starts from her childhood. It seemed that it is the first time taking my class that she chose, chose to do something just for herself. This is the first time that somebody expresses interest in her life story, encouraging her to believe that the feelings are important, that her feelings matter. As mentioned in the beginning of the talk, this is what makes people create. Thank you very much.